How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Can you tell me about reading the original novella? So 1929, what went through your mind when you first read it? I couldn't believe that it was written in 1929, honestly, was the first thing I thought. It felt it felt so sophisticated, even by our standards, honestly. And, it, you know, in 2021 and so nuanced and so delicate and and it was it was celebrated at the time but it was it was also slightly misinterpreted i think in many ways she was a, she was ahead of the of the curve or whatever like you know i think people often assumed it was a a straightforward morality tale that it was what it appeared to be you know that it's about this woman who's passing white um and this other woman who isn't and is therefore morally righteous which a lot of other narratives around this theme did sort of follow that track, but they sort of missed the fundamental point that it's a it's a bit of a red herring. It's not actually about the woman who's hiding her racial identity. It's about the other one and her effect on the other one, and the one who isn't hiding her racial identity but is arguably hiding everything about herself to herself. And then it becomes universally how any one of us negotiate and think about our identity. Like how much freedom do we actually really have to? be the person that we want to be versus the person that we think we ought to be. And how much are we showing to other people of who we actually are? How much do we actually know of who we actually are? Yeah. How much of that is guided by all the systems of various systems of oppression and complication that we live under? So, you know, that's, it's a, I was just struck by its immediacy still. It's, it's delicacy. Also how, how fresh it felt to, to, to read a story that was, that was about the emotional lives of two women of color and their effect on each other. Yes, it's friendship, but it's also, it's complicated. There's envy, there's, there's, there's traction there, there's repression, there's all these things. And that, that felt radical for something written in 1929. As much as you want to now, can you tell me your own sort of connection Mm. or your families when, when you read the book? Well, when I read the book, I was, I was trying to understand my own racial identity there's not, there's not really any other way to put it i i knew on some level that my mother was biracial or mixed race or but it was very murky like it was very very murky and she didn't she didn't have access to the knowledge or the understanding of it um you know sometimes she would say to me maybe maybe I'm black, maybe I'm Native American. I don't really know. There's no way of knowing. And maybe it's nothing. I mean, you know, and I'd look at her and think, but I can can see what I can see. Um, And she also experienced incidents of racism when she was a child. So she had had a certain amount of confirmation that there was some validity to the, the rumors, but she didn't have community or the sense of belonging that comes with having a community and being racialized black because her father was racialized black, was born into a black family and chose to live his life as white at a certain point. And by the time he had my mother and her sisters, he was living entirely as white in Detroit, Michigan, this was. And now me and my mother didn't really understand this until I read this book, as kind of crazy as that sounds. But the the legacy of any of any family that has passing in it is is sort of necessarily obscured and hidden, and often m- members of that family have no idea, you know, because in order to make that choice, you, you know, my grandfather cut himself off from his his relatives, his family, and my mother didn't even know her grandfather's name until recently because I found out, and I found out the story of, of why and how and all the details, but which is fascinating and will take up the entire show if I get into it. But <laughs> it's like, um, you know, the, the book was a really the jumping off point of feeling like I had a compassion and understanding and also historical context for what my grandfather did. And it, and it was the beginning of finding out all the people that got erased from history because of that choice well, from my history. 
let, let's, let's talk a little bit about how you tell this story. I, I was hoping I could play a clip from the film and perhaps we could talk about it. T- take a listen. Sure. Have you ever thought of what you'd do if John found out? Yes. I'd do what I want more than anything right now. I come up here to live. In Harlem. With you. That's a clip from the film where Irene, who is black, asks Claire, who is also black but passing as white, what she would do if her husband, who is white and racist, found out that she was black. And Claire has all these privileges that come with being white in that society, living on that other side. But um, you, you can tell she knows she's not safe. Well, this clip is, um, it's right towards the end. And it's, it's, um, it's a moment when Irene has more knowledge than she is, uh, than she is sharing with her friend. And I suppose it's it's an interesting clip to play because it is I suppose it is quite indicative of the whole style of the film in many many ways because you listen to it and I'm thinking like nothing really is nothing big is being said ostensibly but if you really pick apart what's going on underneath the words of whatever each one of those characters is saying the fact that Claire says with you at the end of that sentence and opens up you know, an almost seduction in the way she operates with Irene. You know, she's she's very, she will do anything and say anything to get what she wants. And that's, she's quite liberated in that way, which is quite um, ironic given her existence is far from liberated. But she is actually quite free as a character. And Irene, who is the complete opposite of that and is so bound by the constrictions that she has in part self-imposed, but mostly society has imposed around being the right kind of mother, the right kind of wife, the right kind of member of the black community, the right kind of friend, the right kind of woman. She's she's so bound by that, she has no freedom to express herself. So in that moment, she can neither tell Claire that what is really going on, that she might be in danger, she can't tell. And also she can't tell Claire that she doesn't want her to be near her, but she also wants nothing more than to be near her. And it's there's there's so many there are many different interpretations, even of that like three lines. Well, I mean that's sort of that's that's sort of what was going through our mind when we chose the clip because it it says so much about and I love what you said at the very beginning that it's very easy to to read the novella and this film as a film about the consequences of being black and, and choosing mm. to pass as white, but in, but in in other ways it's about the consequences of both. Um, and I, I, it's about the consequences of being a person, right? I mean, it's just like the sort of it, there's no, nobody is free in the story, and this is the, the big twist. Actually, nobody is nobody has a free relationship to their desires apart from Claire, and she's the one who has the most obvious mask. But she is actually the most straightforward with her desires and what she wants at any given moment. And everyone else is 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 very everybody, you know the white characters as well are struggling with their their sense of themselves and their sense of who they should be and and how much they are repressing uh, and, and nobody more than irene R- ruth nega and, and tessa thompson um, signed on to this film very early and very enthusiastically mm. from what i from what i understand yeah. what conversations would you have had with them about how you wanted to tell the story I mean, we had a lot of conversations and <laughs> no. we got some, we got some, yeah, obviously. <laughs> but we got, we did manage to get some rehearsal time as well, which was quite precious given we we shot this film in 23 days and, you know, it was a low budget and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, I suppose that the, the most interesting conversations I had with them was, which I was very nervous about, was that I understood that it was going to be quite a, a stylized film on some level. Like there's no... Because, because nothing is what it seems in this film and because nobody says what they're feeling, there has to be both a collective understanding of what the subtextual narratives are, but also there has to be a visual language which works in contradiction with what characters are saying. You know, and, and for that to work, I had to choreograph them quite specifically, you know, whether it's about 
Irene and Claire standing in a shot together and Irene leaves and Claire literally takes her body position in the frame. These sort of tiny details have a kind of eloquence or whether it's Irene saying, I'm beginning to believe that no one is really happy, true or free or safe in her house, which is ostensibly her safe place. But you have the sound of her children thumping very aggressively, literally on top of her head at the same time. You know, these these things are the only way that you can really release the subtext. So I remember saying to them at a certain point, you know, uh, this isn't the kind of movie where you, <laughs> you're going to show up and I'm just going to let you wander around the space and find where you want to be. I'm, I'm going to be annoying. I'm going to put you, apart from anything else, the aspect ratio is so skinny that if you if you wander off, there's a very strong chance that you won't be in the movie. So, <laughs> like, like, you know, I'm I'm going to position you specifically because there has to be a sort of, that has to tell a story too like where you are and where you're standing. So it is, there are some restraints to your acting, but within those spaces, I, I really want you to have complete emotional freedom, which is different to, you know, physical freedom. I, I For me as an actor, I'm always, you know, it's, I always find it a bit overwhelming if you walk into an enormous space and someone's like, okay, go wherever you want and cry. But if someone says you're standing over here and you have this one teacup and you have this one table and this tiny amount of space to move, then I can cry. <laughs> yeah. And, and why did you shoot the film? And why, why is the film in black and white? Well, the film's in black and white because, you know, at first glance, it feels like I'm being very literal, doesn't it? You know, this is a black and white world. Therefore, the film is in black and white. Sure. But if you think about it, it's actually me playing a little trick on our perception of what literalness is, like categories and binaries and all these things, because ultimately the movie is about how none of us can be reduced to one single definition. And ultimately black and white film is not black and white. It's a thousand shades of gray, just like the movie. So, so there's a sort of thematic um, nudge happening there, but it's also, it also gave me a ton of artistic freedom because there is in a, in an abstracted world that doesn't look like our reality. I have the tools of the grayscale to play with lighting states so that I'm constantly able to destabilize a perception of these women's faces at any given moment. I, I, um, I, I, yeah. I, I did love how much, how much thought, and I, I, I hope you can take this in the way that I intend it. I, I did love how much thought I, I had to give to this film and I had the opportunity to give to this film because the film is very sparse. The film is very, yes. very quiet. Do you That's know what very I mean? deliberate. That's very deliberate. It's always been it's always been my feeling about the book is that, you know, you, you can choose to sit back and take the book at face value. Bad choice of words. But um, you know, and and not much happens until something happens, but not much happens. And you're like, well, you know, why am I interested in this? But if you do the work, if you bring of yourself, whatever your, whatever your identity is or whatever your experience of identity is, and you interact with that, then the rewards keep coming. Like the layers keep unfolding. Yeah, but, 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 but as a director, you could have okay, beaten right? us over with a candlestick and said, no, this is what the film is about. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it wouldn't have worked. I mean, there are times when I do have to do that, and it's but it's subtle anyway. You know, there are times when I there are very there are very conscious moments in the movie where I'm tipping tipping my hand in a certain direction, only because I know that in three scenes I'm going to like reverse that. Um, but that that is del that's deliberate. I don't I don't think it's this is all about the gray areas. It's all about the ambiguities. It's all about the in-between spaces. And you've got to let the film exist there. And you've got to let every interpretation that anyone has be possible. Um, it took you more than 10 years to get financing for the film. I know you experienced a fair bit of pushback trying to get it off the ground. Some of that pushback had to do with how people saw your own racial identity, you know, whether or not you should be telling the story. I was cautious at the beginning about, you know, it's a very personal story to you. It's your own private business. And I wanted to be cautious about how I asked about it. How how important was it for you to start talking about your own family's history? It was huge. Yeah. It was huge. I don't, it's, it's, it's honestly, it's difficult to explain, but I don't, it, there's something about, every every family has secrets. And the degrees of those secrets, I think, affect all of our psychology on some level. And I think my mother grew up in a 
in a household where this was a thing that could not be spoken about, would not be spoken about and should not be spoken about. And I think that leaves a child with a sense of shame if it pertains to their identity because it's like well this is not this is not something good if I'm not allowed to talk about it and that has always felt very complicated for me that inheritance on it takes a psychological toll and I you know I can't I can't change how I present I will go through the world looking white and experiencing the world like that but I can choose to honor my heritage and I can try and release some of that narrative by speaking about it very loudly and making art. And my mother has said to me on some very like difficult level to pin down, but she has used the words that she feels liberated. And that is an enormous gift. Like I had to make this film for her. You dedicated the film to her. Yeah. For that reason. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sad you didn't get a chance to watch it together. Me too. I'm hopeful that there will still be another chance. Were you nervous there when you knew she was watching it? Or do you know? Did you, yeah. Did you know? <laughs> Can you imagine? I was terrified. I mean, just terrified. But well, she loved it. She's very proud. Well, let me, um, let me close off this way. It's a very personal film, as we've already established, yet it's a film that gives a lot of space for us to contemplate our own passing, our own costumes, our own stories we tell about one another. So I'll I'll, I'll give you a literal question at the end. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. You're sitting down, two people are sitting down watching this film together in your mind's eye, Mm. in the couch, watching it on Netflix. Mm. They get up. The film is over. They go into the kitchen. What what conversations do you hope they might be having with one another? My favorite is that one of them comes out and says, I know absolutely what that was all about. It was all about this. Might be, you know, any any number of things, adultery, repressed homosexuality, you know, class racism, the patriarchy, whatever. The other one has an absolute idea about the meaning of the film that's one of the other categories. And then they have to fight because they have to prove why. And honestly, there's another whole other gray area that exists in that conversation because where they've got to meet each other is somewhere in the middle. Um, So you make another one. (laughs) You make another gray, ambiguous, non-literal area which I'm really in favor of in life. It sounds to me like you just want to break up marriages through this film is what you're telling me right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you can put it like that. (laughs) Rebecca. Whatever. I'm a quiet provocateur. (laughs) Rebecca, congratulations on the film and thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Rebecca Hall's new film, her first as a director, is called Passing. It is available now on Netflix, but my God, if you can see it in the theater, you certainly should. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely to meet you.